few years ago, I found myself facing a challenging question. And that is, how do we study the absence of something? Now, to put this in perspective, I'm a neuroscientist. And so what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is I poke things to see what happens. So sometimes I poke them with a ruler, sometimes it's a virus, sometimes it's a laser, but regardless of the tool, it's essentially the opposite of asking how we study the absence of something. So you might be asking yourself, why was this question even floating around in my mind in the first place? Well, two things had happened. The first was that I had lost my cat to cancer. And this was a pain that I was very much feeling because she was my first cat, not a family pet, and she'd been with me through grad school and a postdoc. And in many ways, this experience of grief primed me for the day that a colleague called me. I got a phone call from this woman, Dr. Catherine Shear, who's a psychiatrist at Columbia University. And she's an expert in grief and grief therapy. In particular, she treats people who are having difficulty moving on from a loss. She called me to ask, did I think it would be possible to study grief or something similar in animals? I'll be honest, my first reaction was that this sounded completely crazy. But it only takes a quick Google search to realize that there are entire books written about grieving in animals. And furthermore, when there are particularly spectacular displays of grief in animals, it often makes it into the public sphere. So we all know what grief is, but we have a tendency to talk about it in terms of time. We say things like, time heals all wounds, and someone is just moving through the stages of grief. But I think this fails to give credit where credit is due. And that's because time isn't doing anything. Time is passing, and while it's passing, your brain is working really hard to heal itself. Because what your brain has to do is it has to take all of the moments of joy from that relationship, everything that was good about it, and it has to separate it just enough from the pain of the loss till you get to the point where you can describe your memories as bittersweet. And this is absolutely crucial because you need to do this to move on and re-engage with a meaningful life. And it's the subset of people who have difficulty doing this that are treated by my colleague. So here I was. I had a world expert on the phone, and so I did what any good scientist would do. I started asking questions. What do we know? What do we not know about grief? And somewhat surprisingly, what I learned is that we know far less about grief than we do about other complex emotions like fear. But we do know a few things. So one of the things that we know is despite the fact that we tend to conflate grief and depression, they're actually different things. If you give someone who's grieving antidepressants, it won't do anything to alleviate the core symptoms of grief. And when we talk about those core symptoms of grief, we use terms of the heart. We talk about a broken heart, or our hole in our heart, words that give us a sense of yearning for that lost individual. And yearning, quite frankly, is not part of depression. So I also learned that one reason why we don't know more about grief is simply practicalities. So for most of us, when we lose someone we love, our first instinct is not to run out and enroll ourselves in a scientific study. <laughs> and furthermore, there's just some experiments that we can't ethically pursue in humans. And so together, what that means is that there really is a pressing need for another way to study this phenomenon, and especially a pressing need for a way to study it in animals where we can use approaches that we can't use in humans. Now, my colleague hadn't just gotten out her you know, phone list of 1-800 neuroscientists. She had chosen to call me for a reason, and that's because I study these animals. These animals are prairie voles. They're about the size of a mouse. They come from the prairie states of the US. But unlike lab mice and lab rats, these guys are monogamous. And what that means is in the wild, when a male and a female meet, they will mate and they'll go off and share a burrow and they'll take care of the offspring together. And they'll stay together for a lifetime. And so up until that point, I had been researching what in their brains makes them capable of forming these long-term bonds with each other. And what my colleague recognized was that if you can form bonds, you can also lose bonds. And so as a result, we had an animal in which we might be able to study what happens following loss. 
I think one of the things that isn't really appreciated about science is that it's a creative process. So think about how much effort goes into finding that perfect lyric that ties a song together, or how many rounds of revision go into the perfect manuscript or the perfect book. Science is no different. We can't just walk into a room and make up the perfect experiment. It turns out that devising the right experiment to answer your question takes a while. And so this is where I was stuck for a while. I had a species that formed bonds, and I could take their partner away. But then what? How did I know that they were thinking about the lost partner? So I came up with a whole series of ideas, like, OK, I can give them the scent of their partner, and then that'll make them remember their partner. But that feels really mushy. And mushy is not a place that we like to be as scientists. So it's true that I can't ask my voles to fill out a questionnaire about how much they miss their partner, but I can ask them how hard they're willing to work to be reunited with an absent partner. And so the test that we've devised in my lab is one in which <laughs> we train these animals to press a lever. And if they do this, we reward them by giving their partner back, reuniting them. And so we can measure how much they want this based on how many times they're willing to press the, the lever. And so this gives us a quantitative way to ask how motivated are you to reunite with your partner. Now, this behavior is very cool, but what takes it to the next level is that we can actually combine this with the most advanced neuroscientific tools that we have available to date. So one of the things that's really exciting in my lab is that we can take teeny tiny microscopes and we can put them on top of a vole's head. And we can quite literally peer into the animal's brain as they're behaving. And what that looks like is what you see behind me. Now, those spider webs that are crossing the field of view, those are blood vessels. And each of those flashes of light that you see, that's an individual cell firing within the brain. So what we can do is we can say which of these cells is firing when the animal is pressing the lever to be reunited with its partner because those cells are li likely to encode the motivation to reunite with a partner. Now, grief does serve a purpose. When we're with someone and we're away from them for a long time, we have a motivation to reunite with them. And that motivation is healthy. It helps to cement and maintain our relationships over time. But when we lose someone forever, it's not like this motivation just goes away. Instead, it turns into a motivation that can't be fulfilled. And so at the end of the day, Grief is simply a frustration of our desires. So how can we recreate that frustration for an animal? Well, what we've come up with in my lab is to basically put the animals in the same situation, except now we've permanently removed their partner. And here's this lever, and they know if they press it, they get reunited, except now there's a twist. We don't reunite them. And what we'll see is that over time, these animals will press the lever less and less as they come to accept the fact that pressing this lever, this effort that they're expending, will go unrequited. And this process of learning that they will not be reunited is very similar to what we have to do in order to incorporate the finality of a loss in our own lives. So you might be asking yourself, why are we even studying this? Isn't grief normal and natural? And you would be absolutely right. Grief is normal and natural, and it's something that we will all experience, whether it's from a romantic breakup or from the death of someone that we love. But because of this, grief is universal, making it fundamentally part of the human experience. And that's one reason why I think we need to study it. But the other reason is, remember those patients that I mentioned that my colleague treats? It turns out that about one in 10 of us who suffer from the loss of a loved one don't go through the normal mourning process. We stall at some point. And just to put this in perspective for you, imagine waking up every single morning and having it feel like the day after you found out that you lost someone. This is an immense amount of suffering, and it is not suffering that is serving a purpose. And so my hope and my motivation for conducting this research is that by understanding what happens normally, how we adapt to a loss, may give us insight into new ways that we can stimulate and facilitate the normal adaptive process in people who are stalled in their mourning. Because for me at least, 
Losing someone that you love shouldn't mean losing out on joy for the rest of your life.